So in this chapter, we're looking at banking, um, which you would think this would be a much earlier chapter, given that it's the second word in the title of the textbook, and it's a pretty important focus of uh, the course. But the reason why we're only dealing with this now is because the business of running a bank depends on a critical understanding, as probably many of you are realizing, um, with the simulation, it depends on a critical understanding of interest rates and how adjusting the interest rate for the products that you as a bank offer, also the interest rate that um, is external to you, meaning that the interest rate as determined by the Federal Reserve completely and almost um, exclusively determines the nature of your business and whether you're going to succeed or not. And as we saw with bank failures will also determine whether your bank is even going to continue to exist. Um, <clears throat> okay, so with that said, um, what we know is that uh, banks are important. <laughs> um, you know, it, it typically is the case that the most cataclysmic economic events we've had in the United States have um, been associated with a banking crisis of some kind. Um, post-Civil War, um, 1907, um, 1929 to 1940, um, uh, the 1980s, which was a good economic time, but it came after um, a pretty significant recession in the early 80s. Um, and then obviously we have the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. But the only exception we have to that was um, COVID um, and um, the pandemic, largely because that economic crisis wasn't caused by a financial crisis, which is a little bit unusual. Usually you need a financial problem to, to cause other problems. Um, generally, the only exceptions would be war or um, guess a global pandemic. Um, and so you see that um, with 2020. So right, just to kind of review for us, even though it wasn't that long ago, um, the COVID as a was declared a pandemic in the United States in March of 2020. And the very first thing done was dramatically Provided, uh, just providing a, a large amount of government subsidy. Um, the belief was that during the 2008-2009 financial crisis that the government didn't do enough. That was always kind of the regret of many of the people involved in that bailout. Um, ben Bernanke, um, who was Federal Reserve Chairman, being um, one of the large uh, proponents that the government should have spent more. Um, so, uh, the, 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 during the 2008, 2009 crisis, if my memory serves me correct, it was about $785 billion was the total amount of the direct subsidy provided, uh, for banks and just in general, the financial crisis. Um, in 2020, with the pandemic, we're talking about trillions of dollars. If my memory serves me correct, it was about two or three trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. Where did it all go? Well, <laughs> a part of it went to this Paycheck Protection Program, which was pretty expensive. And what it meant was that businesses were basically given loans that would be forgiven if they continued to keep employees on the payroll you know, in an attempt to keep the unemployment numbers lower. At the same time, um, you know, um, and banks also, you know, defined as small businesses, um, you know, were given a role in lending out that money as a way to kind of drum up business for them. So these small banks made um, a good deal of these paycheck protection loans where the government was basically the guarantor of the loan. At the same time as the banks are doing a lot of business making out these paycheck protection 
loans, people are also getting a lot of money from the government. Um, everyone got 1200 bucks, um, if you kind of remember. Plus, those of you who have kids, um, like myself, um, we also got extra money for having kids, um, like extra amounts of money for like childcare subsidies and, and whatnot. So that's a lot of volume of money going into banks at the time. So what you have to do is now keep in mind, how is that changing the banking business? What we also see, um, not so much in the 2020 COVID time period, but we especially saw in um, 2008 to 2009, and we certainly saw in the 1980s during the savings and loan crisis, and especially so, especially so during the, um, um, during the Great Depression was a large number of bank failures. And so that kind of brings about this question in general of, you know, if banking, um, you know, is how risky of a business is it? And then kind of how should you run your operations? Now, I generally don't show any videos or anything during um, uh, these lectures, but let's just watch one right now. I'm going to pause this to set up the video. So one of the um, the video I want to show you is comes from the very first uh, fireside chat. So for those of you who are students of history in some way, you would know that um, Franklin Roosevelt, during the kind of depths of the recession, when he first comes into office in 1933, he creates these fireside chats that are delivered by radio. And it was an attempt to kind of um, have people listen to him, you know, in their homes using you know, the, the radio, which would have been the primary means of quick communication. And the idea of what calling it a fireside chat is, right, you'd be, you'd finish a long work day, you'd be sitting by the fire warming up, and you would turn on the radio because the president's going to be on it, and the president would talk about something that he felt was important. And so for the very first one, um, it was in uh, March of 1933, um, the very first one um, was about banks. And you'd be like, well, dude, the very first one you're going to do is about banks. And the reason why was because one of the first acts that he did in that kind of first hundred days, you know, where all this action was occurring, was he declared a bank holiday. And what that meant was that all the banks were going to shut down. And you can imagine how scary that is if you're now several years into a depression and all of a sudden you had your money at the bank thinking that it was gonna be safe there. And now all of a sudden it's, the bank's not gonna reopen. So let's look at that and see. It's again, the very first one that he did. Um, okay, so we're gonna play this right now. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. So I'm going to pause this as we're, as we're kind of going through this here. So the idea here is that um, right, he's going to basically explain banking to a population in about nine minutes, um, you know, to a population that doesn't have any, um, you know, high education level about what's, um, you know, how banks work and, and operate. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, 
I shall continue to have your cooperation as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit. And so that was kind of the probably shocking moment, perhaps, for those of, of those of um, the population that were listening to the speech, because, right, usually, you know, back in those days when people would go to branches, right, you'd have all these teller desks, right, and you would go to the teller, and behind all the tellers was generally um, a very large vault, right, which kind of the big door and whatnot, right, and um, the idea or the belief was that money just went into that vault. Now, it... It, it wasn't a, um, it's an antiquated belief that that, again, is how banks work. And hopefully, if you didn't even understand it before this course, so hopefully that's dramatically um, um, uh, apparent today that banks make money by making loans. It, it's historically based, 1500s, medieval era, when banks, who are basically just goldsmiths, um, you know, did that practice of, you know, holding securely and not making out loans, just holding securely your gold holdings. You know, there are no 100% reserve banks out there um, today. Um, they just aren't. The bank wouldn't make any money doing that. And so here, um, this would be, again, where he's kind of dismissing that notion that that's how banks um, are operating in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. A comparatively small part of the money that you put into the bank is kept in currency, an amount which in normal times is wholly sufficient to cover the cash needs of the average citizen. In other words, the total amount of all the currency in the country is only a comparatively small proportion of the total deposits in all the banks of the country. What then happened during the last few days of February and the first few days of March? Because of undermined confidence on the part of the public, there was a general rush by a large portion of our population to turn bank deposits into currency or gold. A rush so great that the soundest banks couldn't get enough currency to meet the demand. The reason for this was that on the spur of the moment, it was of course impossible to sell perfectly sound assets of a bank and convert them into cash, except at panic prices far below their real value. And so right there, you've got this notion that he's explaining basically to people what are bank runs. Do bank runs represent a bank having operated improperly, or as he describes it here, that the, you know, that banks as a business were never set up for all depositors to be able to go to the bank at once. That's just not the nature of their business. And so because that happened, um, you know, it created a entry point for the government to basically create more rules and regulations to kind of control the outflow of deposits, such that the whole banking system um, isn't um, repeatedly brought down by these bank runs. By the afternoon of March 3rd, a week ago last Friday, scarcely a bank in the country was open to do business. Pro uh, sorry, I got to pause right here. Um, so as, as most of you know in this class, I used to be um, with the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago. And... Um, you know, I don't know whether this is true or not. I'm just telling you what um, other um, Federal Reserve officials would tell me, kind of, you know, like old guys, you know, just, you know, talking about stuff at lunch. Um, but the one story they would always tell to say to me was, you know, in Chicago, again, most of the banks were um, shut down and, and whatnot. But that there was one bank that survived um, the Great Depression without closing at all. Um, I think it was called State Street Bank or, or something like that in Chicago. And um, the reason why was because the president of the bank, uh, 
um, always walk to work, um, you know, from the L station to, to work, um, uh, always carrying an umbrella, whether it looked like it was going to rain or not. And that people would say to each other, well, geez, if, um, you know, he's that cautious, right, that he's always just going to wear, uh, that he's always going to use a, um, an umbrella, always carry an umbrella just in case something bad were to happen, then we know our money is going to be safe there. I mean, imagine that, that you've got to rely on rumor and whatnot to kind of, you know, <laughs> um, decide where you're going to save your money. It's a pretty scary time back in the 1930s. Again, I don't know if the story is true. I'm just telling you what other bankers at the Federal Reserve Bank told me. Proclamations closing them in whole or in part had been issued by the governors in almost all of the states. It was then that I issued the proclamation providing for the National Bank holiday. And this was the first step in the government's reconstruction of our financial and economic fabric. The second step, last Thursday, was the legislation promptly and patriotically passed by the Congress, confirming my proclamation and broadening my powers so that it became possible in view of the requirement of time to extend the holiday and lift the ban of that holiday gradually in the days to come. This law also gave authority to develop a program of rehabilitation of our banking facilities. And I want to tell our citizens in every part of the nation that the National Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, showed by this action a devotion to public welfare and a realization of the emergency and the necessity for speed that it is difficult to match in all our history. The third stage has been the series of regulations permitting the banks to continue their functions to take care of the distribution of food and household necessities and the payment of payroll. This bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Remember that no sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors last week. Neither is any bank which may turn out not to be in a position for immediate opening. The new law allows the 12 Federal Reserve Banks to issue additional currency on good assets, and thus the banks that reopen will be able to meet every legitimate call. The new currency is being sent out by the... So, <laughs> he's burying the lead here. Um, two things are happening here. Um, and then I'll rewind it so that you can re-listen to what was just being said here. So this is kind of buried in minute five of this nine-minute speech. Two things. First thing is um, a solution not too different from what um, the Federal Reserve uh, did with um, Silicon Valley Bank um, last year, which was they were willing to accept um, assets at, um, at uh, book value rather than market value, which meant that, um, you know, again, certain assets um, were going to be valued higher than the market and accepted um, for full par value. The other thing he's saying, which really is hidden here, is that Franklin Roosevelt took the U.S. currency off of the gold standard um, in 1933, on June 5th, 1933. And so what that meant is that you that the government was no longer going to issue only as much currency as it had cash, as it had gold equivalents. Rather, it was going to have the power to, uh, of fiat, right, to just designate the U.S. dollar as the official currency and then just print as much as it wanted and uh, eliminate gold convertibility. A pretty significant change there to the value of the currency. Okay, I'm just going to rewind it a little bit and then replay. And thus the which may turn out not to be in a position for immediate opening. The new law allows the 12 Federal Reserve Banks to issue additional currency on good assets, and thus the banks that reopen will be able to meet every legitimate call. The new currency is being sent out by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, 
in large volume to every part of the country. Dude, you really don't want to hear that in large volume. <laughs> uh, that would be inflation. It is sound currency because it is backed by actual good assets. Another question that you will ask is this. Why are all the banks not to be reopened at the same time? The answer is simple, and I know you will understand it. Your government does not intend that the history of the past few years shall be repeated. We do not want and will not have another epidemic of bank failures. As a result, we start tomorrow, Monday, with the opening of banks in the 12 Federal Reserve Bank cities. Those banks which on first examination by the Treasury have already been found to be all right. That will be followed on Tuesday by the resumption of all other functions by banks already found to be sound in cities where there are recognized clearing houses. That means about 250 cities of the United States. In other words, we're moving as fast as the mechanics of the situation will allow us. On Wednesday and succeeding days, banks in smaller places all through the country will resume business subject, of course, to the government's physical ability to complete its survey. It is necessary that the reopening of banks be extended over a period in order to permit the banks to make applications for the necessary loans, to obtain currency needed to meet their requirements, and to enable the government to make common sense checkups. Please let me make it clear to you that if your bank does not open the first day you are by no means justified in believing that it will not open. A bank that opens on one of the subsequent days is in exactly the same status as the bank that opens tomorrow. I know that many people are worrying about state banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve System. There is no occasion for that worry. Sorry about the hit there, hunger pause there. Um, I, I paused the video there because, right, we we are kind of hearkening back to this idea that we do have a different um, system then in terms of, right, we have, we have state chartered banks um, as well as uh, federally chartered banks. Here he's only really talking about the federally chartered banks because that's really all that as president of the U.S. and the federal system he has control over. And so he doesn't want to, at this point, um, uh, have people choosing federally chartered banks over state chartered banks because that will make the entire system weaker. So he has to kind of walk a fine line here and say that, you know, state chartered banks also aren't necessarily weak. And of course, they are under the immediate control of the state banking authorities. These state banks are following the same course as the national banks, except that they get their licenses to resume business from the state authorities. And these authorities have been asked by the Secretary of the Treasury to permit their good banks to open up on the same schedule as the national banks. And so I am confident that the state banking departments will be as careful as the national government in the policy relating to the opening of banks and will follow the same broad theories. It is possible that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs, except, of course, the hysterical demands of hoarders. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime in every part of our nation. It needs no profit to tell you that when the people find that they can get their money, that they can get it when they want it for all legitimate purposes, the phantom of fear will soon be laid. People will again be glad to have their money where it will be safely taken care of and where they can use it conveniently at any time. I can assure you, my friends, that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than it is to keep it under the mattress. All right, so right there, 
they were kind of getting to the closing comments here for this speech, but the idea here is that um, the U.S. economic system relies entirely on a strong banking system existing, and a banking system relies on deposits. And the only way you're going to get deposits is if you convince people to put their money in the bank and not store it at home. And um, obviously, um, that's what has to, to um, uh, that's what he's trying to inspire here. The success of our whole national program depends, of course, on the cooperation of the public, on its intelligent support, and its use of a reliable system. <clears throat> Remember that the essential accomplishment of the new legislation. Uh, well, I guess he's going to be continuing to talk here, but he stopped talking. Well, anyway, um, that's the only part that we really cared about, though. So, okay, let's, no, I don't need to watch that. Okay, so let's go back to here. I'm going to pause this here, and then I'll restart it. Okay, so let's get to um, starting to talk about uh, the things that you're looking at already with the um, uh, simulation. Um, the way that we're going to understand the bank as a business, and quite frankly, the way you understand any business, is by looking at its balance sheet. Now, you don't have to be uh, really an accountant to understand what a balance sheet does, meaning you don't need that level of detail. Uh, essentially, what we have are two sides here assets and liabilities. We have shareholder equity as well, but let's just ignore that. We have assets and liabilities, meaning that um, assets are, as the term implies, are something that's um, owned. Liabilities are something that are owed. And essentially, the one side of the ledger has to equal the other. Really, the art of, you know, if any of you have taken even accounting one, um, the whole idea is understanding them how to classify a certain transaction. Is the transaction an asset or a liability? That's kind of what your you know, job is in accounting one. And there we go. So our assets are things of value that are owned. Liabilities are things that are owed. And then um, generally the assets need to equal the liabilities. But for most for-profit businesses, they wouldn't, that there would be a difference between the two, and that difference between the two would be our shareholder equity, you know, what the shareholders own. And so we can see that for a typical bank, the largest liability are the deposits. Why are they liabilities? Because, right, the deposit holders could come to the bank and ask for their money back. The largest assets are loans, right? The loans are something that the bank owns that is of value because it's got, it has someone that owes it money and is going to be paying it back. Reserves, right, which is the kind of, you know, simple kind of understanding of what banks do is that they store cash. We can see here is not a very big part of their business. It's pretty small you know, typically speaking, that for the most part, it's loans and then buying um, securities are the, the assets and it uses that money to make loans. Now, this is a little bit old here, but you don't have to rely on um, this, right? We could, um, all you have to simply do here is, you know, we could get the data, we can get newer data here. And we can see the release for, looks like for, let's just look at it for May 10th, right? And we can get the same understanding of what all the numbers are for the different things. All transparent, all um, fully disclosed, just the question of do we all look at it? And most likely we don't. So now let's look at individual components of this balance sheet. The one part of this would be the um, big thing, which are the checkable deposits. Checkable deposits, which, you know, in old school days, like for someone like myself, would be the time where you are, you know, actually writing checks, which would mean making cash available on demand. That's what the check does. It's an order to 
you know, withdraw the cash. Um, so we call these checkable deposits demand deposits. We could also call them now accounts. Now accounts is a really old fashioned, like 1970s era way of calling a checking account. Um, because there was a difference, um, checking accounts used to by law not be able to pay interest where savings accounts could, that kind of differentiation is now uh, gone. Even checking accounts pay interest today. It's just that it's incredibly, incredibly low. But in any case, these demand deposits, which are in essence, again, savings accounts, the checking accounts, um, whether they pay interest or not, all of these are liabilities. Um, for the bank. And then we also have um, accounts, as all of you would know, just by virtue of the fact that you have certain accounts um, that you've opened as a, as a saver, which are called non-transaction deposits, meaning that you don't, you know, live your daily life transactions funded with these accounts. And the biggest one of these would be um, well, savings accounts technically are, are, are part of this, um, but the biggest ones would be your money market deposit accounts and your um, certificates of deposit. Um, money market deposit accounts, you see these, so there's a, a pretty big, um, I'm just going to go with my local bank here, Bank of Hawaii. So Bank of Hawaii is uh, one of the largest banks here on the islands. Um, and if I just looked at personal accounts and I looked um, at savings, I'm just looking at this for the first time, so I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to see. Um, they don't make it easy to see what the rates are for certain things, do they? Um, Um, and they don't make it easy. And I'm not sure they're being completely 100%. Oh, here we go. So by law, they have to have this sheet. They sure as hell made it really difficult to find it. Probably because they don't want people cost uh, comparing things. But what I was looking for here was this idea that you've got, for instance, um, you've got checking accounts, again, that are paying some minor amounts of interest. You have savings accounts that are paying some minor amounts of interest. And then you've got what are called these weird things like bonus rate savings. Um, you know, like the, the question you would nat naturally, uh, well, the question you would naturally ask yourself are, what are these? These would be things are there. Um, you have to restrict the money a little bit more. But now here's what I want you to compare. So savings accounts paying 0 0.01, minimum open $100. Um, you have to have at least $1 to earn the interest rate of 0 0.01. I'm not sure I'd want to say you're chasing yield here, but what if you really want to earn some more money? You could do this money market savings account, which actually does pay a little bit more. And the question would be is why? And that's because there's obviously a little bit more risk involved. That little bit more risk is because this money um, is being invested. Um, your, sa your savings, your, your money you deposit is being invested in the money market. What is the money market? Again, that would be like buying treasuries, bonds, whatnot. The money market, these are essentially like um, ETFs. So a money market ETF, we would call it fixed income, but right, it would be ultra short bonds. I'm just picking on one here now. I'm gonna probably get a bunch of ads for um, Prudential. Um, but the idea here is that the yields are gonna be really low, and, and they are, right? That's not even above um, inflation. Um, but it's going to be right. It's going to be holding uh, ultra safe, short term maturity. 
government assets, which would mean that unlike just cash that's sitting in your vault, the right the bank technically would have to go into market when markets are open to be able to sell it, which almost always will be okay, except it wasn't in 2008, 2009, where money market ETF broke the dollar. Um, and so here you see this here, it doesn't happen very often. Um, again, the only time I remember it happening, yeah, was uh, 2008, September 16th, I guess, 2008, when the reserve primary fund ETF broke the buck, meaning that the value, the share price of the money market fund wasn't dollar for dollar, rather it was less than a dollar, which, right, now people are going to take their money out of the bank and it will cause, looks like a really interesting article to read. Um, I will PDF it and post it to Canvas. Okay. And then our other part to this here would be um, our CDs, which probably you have maybe have owned it at some point in time. Um, certificates of deposit give you an even higher uh, rate of interest, but you have to agree to keep it there for six months, nine months, a year, two years, three years, and so on. And again, banks are funding this all by making loans. So let's now look at the other side of the balance sheet. On the other side of the balance sheet, we are um, making loans to individuals. We are making loans to um, other banks, or we are buying um, loans in the, um, uh, well, we're making loans basically um, uh, to other banks. Um, in a variety of ways, either these repos, the repurchase agreements. Um, if a bank needs money for an immediate need and they'll pay you back tomorrow, they will give you a security, such as a treasury bill, for a day to kind of hold on to. You'll give that bank cash and then the bank will come back and say, I'm going to buy it back from you the next day. And it does that so that it has cash overnight. Those repurchase agreements also were destroyed during the 2008-2009 crisis, which we'll look at more in, in Chapter 12. But those agreements were destroyed because banking was so untrustworthy, you wouldn't even be willing to lend it money to another bank overnight because you didn't know what was going to go on. And then obviously you've got other loans that you can get from the banking system. Um, and these loans that you make um, in the other parts of the banking system, you could also borrow money instead of borrowing it from other banks. You could borrow money from the Federal Reserve. You could do it through um, directly through discount loans, or as you're seeing in the simulation, you could do it through the um, home loan banks as well. Um, When I started work at the Federal Reserve Bank in 1999, that was, that's a while ago, right? We're talking about 25 years ago here. Um, the entire operations of the Federal Reserve System were financed by the processing of checks, which even if you look at this chart, was declining. Now, I remember, you know, we'd bring in these fancy people wearing fancy suits and they would come in and they would tell us, you know, other ways to make checking more popular and whatnot. And the reason why is because the Federal Reserve made about 87 and a half cents per check processed. That banks would pay the Federal Reserve about 87 and a half cents to process a check, no matter what the value was. So we made a lot of money. And while we have 12 district banks, Within each district, we would have five, um, let's see, in District 7, where I was in Chicago, we had a branch in Milwaukee, we had one in Detroit, we had one in Peoria, that's three, we had one in Des Moines, that was four. Um, did we have any others? I think we had four. So we had four 
branch offices and then we had the Chicago office. And all that those branch offices did is they processed checks. They collected checks and sent them down to us. Checks were a big part of the business. Now, a lot of that goes away now that we have ACH transfers and whatnot, where the bank makes, the Federal Reserve makes a lot less. Um, the ACH system, the automated clearinghouse system that you see, the way that you get, for instance, your payroll check, um, the way that you do like PayPal payments and um, actually not PayPal, the way that you do Zelle payments are all ACH directly with um, your bank account. Um, the Federal Reserve makes less and the Federal Reserve is actually replacing the ACH system um, with a different system now. Um, but what we're seeing here, both on the previous slide as well as this slide, um, is that um, banks or that individuals um, are still kind of holding on to using checkable deposits. And especially with COVID, is that people did save a lot of money and did put money into CDs. It's just that the, the revolution that's happening now is that people are more willing to um, save their money with online only banks like Ally and um, SoFi and, and other kinds of banks that have only an internet presence and not a physical presence. Um, and again, if we look at these, you know, how do banks get money? Again, they can either borrow from other banks, they would get the money obviously from depositors. Um, they could have some money um, their other asset could be from the shareholder side. And that would be they either get some money from shareholders who initially purchased the shares, or that the bank has assets because it's got a profit that it doesn't return back to the shareholders. So that would be retained profits. Um, banks don't want to hold a lot of vault cash. Banks don't want to hold a lot of reserves. This is money that's just sitting around, not earning you anything. So banks will, should want to just keep the minimum amount of reserves. But as you saw kind of in my previous lectures here, that banks aren't actually following this. That if we were to look, again, the data is a little old here. Uh, Okay, I know I put it down here and I said I was going to um, PDF it, but I've already gotten rid of the site here. But if you interested, now I know again this is um, discontinuous. This goes back just to 2021. Uh, but I know you already saw this, but I'm just going to repeat it again. You can get the data, but you'd have to go through something else here. Not, um, sorry, not that long. Banks since 2008, 2009 have just been holding a lot of um, excess reserves, which means that the banking system, the, the business of running a bank is just so much different than it was when I was being trained as an economist and when I worked in banking, it's just very different. Banks are just holding lots of excess reserves, um, which, right, if they were to hire me as a consultant and I would come in I'd just be incredibly surprised because it doesn't make a lot of sense. That's a lot of cash sitting on the side that's not do that's not working. Earning the bank money as a business. Um, so again, uh, and the problem that we get here with our textbook is that the authors of the textbook are even older than me. <laughs> Hubbard and O'Brien are even older than me. So there is outdated um, in their notion of how much banks hold as excess reserves that we, me, Hubbard, O'Brien, you know, old economists like myself, all believe that excess reserves were small, or sorry, that required reserves were really the only reserves that were holding that excess reserves were small. And that's just not the way that banks exist today. Why is that, right? So you can understand at least in the beginning of COVID or in the beginning of the 2008, 2009 crisis that you would hold a lot of excess reserves because you didn't really know what was gonna be happening, right? You had a financial crisis, you had an unknown pandemic and you would just hold a lot of cash. But why it continues to exist today in 2024 when COVID is for the most part in the rear view mirror, 
is beyond, you know, kind of my scope of understanding. Okay. I'm just going to pause. And so then the other part of the um, balance sheet for banks would be looking at its securities. And again, you're seeing this in the simulation. But the idea is that banks are going to make loans, right? And they're going to earn money for the bank as a business with the net interest margin. The difference between uh, what banks have to pay out for deposits versus what they're collecting um, as loans. But that the bank is going to also um, is it's not investing in the stock market. These aren't investment banks. These are depository banks. And so depository banks have limits on what they can invest in as marketable securities. And that banks is the second bullet point highlights is that banks are pretty much only permitted to buy some investment grade corporate bonds, some municipal bonds, and then um, bonds that are issued by the, the Treasury, um, the US Treasury and other government sponsored uh, entities, GSEs. Um, <clears throat> there's some rules around what they can kind of count as things, uh, meaning that you could, um, you can count, um, you can count um, certain amounts of treasuries um, as secondary reserves, um, and that would allow you to um, uh, not have to hold as much reserves in cash. And also it should it be pointed out that um, the corporate bonds um, that uh, banks can hold, they can't use depositors' money, checkable deposits, um, to um, to put into those corporate bonds. Um, they would have to be using, um, for instance, non-transaction savings like CDs, um, or they would have to be using their own internal profits um, to be doing those things. And then if, if we look at the, the, you know, on the asset side, more so than securities. Again, the, the largest part of this is going to be um, loans. Um, loans, and again, you're seeing this in the simulation, but we've got loans that are made to businesses. Uh, in our simulation, we also see agricultural loans, which are backed by the USDA in many, po in many points. Uh, we have consumer loans. That would be what we use to, to buy cars, um, lines of credit that we could use to pay off um, you know, credit card debt, whatnot. And then we've obviously got real estate loans. This would be uh, either residential mortgages, which is gonna be a big part of most banks' business and uh, commercial mortgages. Now, um, these loans are generally, um, not generally, but they are less liquid than the securities because you could go out, as long as it's a trading day, you can, um, you know, you can sell your um, you can sell your securities in the market as long as the market is open. Um, loans you can't you, you can sell the residential mortgages to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right, and get the cash, and that way it's not sitting on your books. But you know, you can sell your loan portfolio to others, but that's going to take time, and you're not necessarily going to get a good price for it. So you either have to be committed to holding on to your loans if you're a bank running it as a business, or you're going to have to already have your partners identified so that you don't just have these loans sitting on your book forever and ever. Um, but as we can see here, um, for the most part with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac working, um, uh, most banks today, as we see here, most of their business is um, real estate loans, which, to be honest, um, gives us an idea. I'm not trying to spread bad rumors here, but just think about this. So what is it? Something like 75, 80% of mortgages out there, residential mortgages out there, 
um, were either taken out or refinanced um, in 2020 or 2021, which means that most people are paying around 3% or so for their mortgages. That sucks if you're a bank. You're sitting on a portfolio of 3% interest paying um, assets, and yet you're paying out deposits much higher, right? You can get out some CDs right now that are paying like 4%, 5%, right? How do you make a business of that? It makes business a lot tougher. And you unfortunately might get a little bit more aggressive in making your loans or making out riskier loans, which, right, which then undermines the whole health of the banking system um, and the financial market. Now, there's other assets that banks hold, and you'll see this in the balance sheet. You know, the bank obviously has, you know, um, computer equipment, real estate. Um, it has the collateral it received from borrowers who defaulted, right? So it has like Chevy Malibus and Nissan Altimas that people didn't pay their loans on. Uh, but all of this other assets are generally going to be pretty small in size and of, of value. Assets equal liabilities, right? That would be what an accountant would get as a, um, um, that would be what an accountant would get as a tattoo if they could get one. Um, and, um, you know, it's, um, it's true. Um, but what we also have to take into account is that um, you need to um, account for the difference between the two, and that difference between the two would be the um, um, uh, shareholder equity or the bank's net worth. And that would be, again, just the difference between the two. It's sizable. It's about a 10% difference between the two. And this would be either what the shareholders put into the banking system um, you know, by purchasing the shares, or it would be that as the bank is generating profits, that it's choosing not to return it to shareholders in the form of dividends or buybacks, that it's just going to retain the profits. And that bank capital is significant. So for prop banks operate generally on a for-profit basis. Credit unions are non-for-profit, but these banks that are running on a for-profit basis, those profits are significant, about 10% of assets. Okay, and so then what we kind of see here um, um, are basically the various categories of what we talked about for um, uh, a bank, right, is that um, here we have, um, <clears throat> you know, assets and liabilities for the bank, and then reorganizing it, we would create our ledger or our balance sheet construction where essentially, again, a good accountant would then take all of these entries and properly classify everything as either an asset or a liability. And that the difference between the two, between the assets and the liabilities, would have to be the bank capital, right? And that we could construct various um, uh, calculations such as its bank's capital as a percentage of its assets. So we could look at the bank capital as $231 billion, divide that by the total amount of assets, and we'd see that's about 10%. So again, there's our kind of T account, which you, again, should be seeing, for instance, in your simulation. And I'm hoping, too, that the simulation is kind of doing some of the work of these slides rather than being so... Um, static like this, um, that you're kind of seeing it in real action um, on the, um, in the simulation. Now, the way that banks make their money, the most important acronym, if you were to be a person that invests in um, uh, banks, would be this, NIM, the net interest margin. Again, as I just had previously mentioned, that's again our difference between what the banks are making um, on interest for loans it makes, and then the interest it pays for that money to have that money to be able to lend out to others. That would be the money it pays for deposits. So that difference between the two, subtracting the two, gets us our net interest margin. 
And then another important um, ratio for banks that are uh, for being a bank investor would be that you're looking at your your ROA, your return on assets, and that would be your after tax uh, profit um, divided by your bank assets as a whole. You know how much money are, are being generated by the assets you have in the bank. So we've got net interest margin, we have return on assets, ROA, and then we also have ROE, return on equity. Now this is important for any kind of business operation um, in the stock market, but the ROE would be instead of now dividing by our assets, we look at um, our total bank capital. And we can, obviously the two are gonna be related. Um, and so that return on equity essentially is going to be our, um, our return on equity would equal our return on assets times our ratio of our assets to our capital. So the issue for any of these kinds of banks is that if you've got then investors that are looking at things like your ROA and looking at your ROE, is that as the, it says in bold here at the top then, is that um, managers of banks and other financial firms are going to find themselves from time to time facing an incentive to um, to hold a large amount of um, uh, assets, which isn't necessarily going to be a good thing, because these assets are sometimes banks, or sorry, are sometimes loans, which again can make the bank. Uh, more leveraged than it would otherwise want to be. So to be highly leveraged means that um, you've got a high ratio of assets to the value of your capital, which in our case then means is that um, you can be earning a lot of money, you know, that these assets are working for you, but at the other, um, say, at the same point, and this is kind of what's highlighted here at the bottom, is that it works the other way as well. Is that if the bank loans go, if the loans at the bank make go bad, then um, your losses will be um, multiplied as well to a, a very large ratio. So you want to, as, as you're going through the simulation, you'll want to watch and make sure that your, um, your leverage ratio is kept under control. It's difficult though. Um, and the reason why it's difficult is because we have a fairly large amount of moral hazard. The, the moral hazard, if you remember back um, from the principles classes and whatnot, essentially just means that the managers of the bank, the ones that are deciding whether to make loans or not, um, um, have an incentive to say that they're doing one thing and then do another. Um, they don't have, their their interests are not aligned with the interest of the shareholders or the depositors of the bank necessarily. Because, um, right, if they're going to get commissions, especially, um, or if they just want to keep their job or move up to a higher job, then they're going to take on more risk um, than others would uh, be willing to. And so that's what we kind of see here, is that then what banks find is that they have to incentivize their managers in ways other than, um, in ways other than just giving them commissions because commissions um, can drive managers to take on more leverage than they otherwise would. Additionally, if the manager makes mistakes, the depositors and uh, the depositors are largely isolated from the risks, um, and that would be because of the FDIC. So the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insures everyone's deposits up to $250,000. And so what that means is that depositors aren't looking at the balance sheets of banks. They just know they're going to get their 250 k back. And the only time we get hot and bothered about a bank and its leverage ratio is usually when it's about to fail like your NYCB, your New York Community Bank, or, or others. The only 
um, agency than kind of ensuring that everyone is doing what they should be doing would be you have the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, state banking regulators, ensuring that the banks are meeting their capital requirements, that they have enough capital um, uh, to back the um, assets that they have. Okay, I'm gonna pause here, pause here. Pause here. So what it comes down to then um, for banks is, and, and, and how they're able to kind of continue to exist as a business is that they're able to manage their liquidity risk. Um, meaning that they're able to preserve the value of their assets in such a way that they could quickly sell them if needed to, um, but otherwise that the assets are generating enough of a return that they can um, then turn around and um, um, earn more money than they have to pay to raise the money through deposits. So that managing that liquidity risk then all comes down to managing the assets. Um, it, with a large bank like Bank of Hawaii or whatnot that I showed you, generally, if they have an incredibly fancy headquarters building, there's generally an entire floor um, all devoted to uh, buying and selling existing treasuries, um, managing uh, an important asset for the bank. You know, loan departments have floors and floors of the headquarters managing, again, that asset um, that the bank has. And again, you're managing both the quality of the assets, but you're also managing how quickly you can turn it into cash if needed, meaning managing that liquidity risk. Yes, banks can do things if they make a mistake in managing their liquidity or the quality of their assets. Small, small, small mistakes can be corrected for with uh, repurchase agreements and whatnot uh, with repos, but you don't really want to have to rely on repurchase agreements or discount loans. I'm not even sure why the textbook here or the slide makes it seem like that's a reasonable thing to do because it's not. Um, I've been in banking at least long enough, again, a little bit dated, but long enough to know um, people talk, especially bankers. And if your bank is known as one that has to rely on these repurchase agreements or certainly a discount loan to make it through the day or make it through the week, no one's gonna trust you. Um, they're not gonna trust anything you say and your future as a bank is gonna be pretty limited. So. I'm not even sure why it says, um, you just can't do that much of it. Usually it's the beginning of the end when you're heavily relying on repurchase agreements um, or especially on discount loans. Discount loans are just so small. Now, how do you manage then these loans that you're making out? Well, the way you've got to do it is you've got to you know, you've got to manage the types of loans that you're making. So just like investing, you know, where the investor is told that they need to diversify the assets that they hold, banks also need to diversify the, um, the loans that they hold, meaning that they don't want to um, lend out too, money, too, too much money to a, a single borrower, and even that they don't want to lend out too much money to a single type of borrower. Right, like let's say commercial or being more specific, let's say to a certain kind of business, right? Let's say like, again, dentists, right? Because if something happens where, let's just create a, a doomsday scenario, um, right? Most people have dental insurance and um, most dentists accept dental insurance. But what if in, in the crazy world of dental insurance, there's really only one big dental insurer that would be Delta Dental. So let's just say that Delta Dental then decided to reduce its um, coverage rates. That would mean that all dentists then collectively are gonna be receiving less, which then means that collectively, all of your dentists are gonna have a harder time paying back their loans. And poof, there goes your bank. Uh, right? And we can create those doomsday scenario for, there's no safe 
<laughs> there's no safe borrower, right? If you if you lend too much, because you can create a doomsday scenario where that one type of borrower is uh, heavily impacted, and because that's your only kind of borrower, then your bank is probably done. Okay, so you know what? How do banks then control for this? Well, they would do things like looking at your credit score. Um, they would, um, right, that's often useful if we're talking about individuals. Um, we would look at your, if you were a corporation, we'd look at your score on like Moody's, um, another kind of credit rating systems. Um, and the best individuals out there pay what's called the prime rate. These are your highest quality borrowers. Um, a pretty good listing of these would be um, on the Wall Street Journal. We can generally get a good sense of what the uh, rates are. Um, I haven't looked at this in a while, which shows how. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal rate would be known as a place where you could look at your rates pretty quickly. And I remember using to, used to look at this so extensively, but even the Wall Street Journal has changed uh, quite a bit. Um, God, this makes me seem so old school. Okay, I'm just gonna type in the simple thing of rates. Um, and you really have changed it. Um, Do you want to go here and from here? Okay, I'm not going to keep looking. Anyway, the Wall Street Journal used to, and I'm sure they still do it, just I would have to hunt for it a bit, a bit more. Um, oh, here we go. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Um, and we should be able to see, uh, here we just see treasury bills and rates. Uh, they got the VIX. Uh, Shading stop looking for it. Um, yeah, never mind. I'm not going to keep looking for it. That's the prime rate. It looks like we're just finding articles. Okay, never mind. Give up. It's sad. <laughs> um, but anyway, the prime rate used to be the primary interest rate that um, your highest quality borrowers would pay. Now we're typically just um, using the prime rate either plus a certain uh, percentage. So if you look at your credit cards, for instance, they typically say prime plus like 15% or 14%. Um, or they would just say um, a certain interest rate that's published in the Wall Street Journal um, or investors business um, daily um, on a certain day as a way to kind of lock in um, what your interest rate charges are going to be. So right, you, we obviously know about things. You can look at your credit score and whatnot, and that would give you your FICO score, um, Fair Isaac score. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, <laughs> um, credit scores are pretty important. This isn't a personal investing course, so I'm not going to, you don't need me to tell you that credit scores are important. Um, I don't know. I find myself caring less about my credit score now that I own a home. I mean, you used to like make all these, you know, I used to make like all these moves just because I'm trying to preserve and protect my also precious credit score. But now that I own a home and, and everything else, I care a lot less and, um, than I probably should. Um, what goes into that score? A bunch of things. But again, you could go on to creditkarma.com and whatnot, and you could look up your credit score. This isn't a, a banking course. Um, 
I don't know. My wife and I are both poor. I don't know. Does that say anything about our credit score? <laughs> um, but yeah, so one way you would try to manage your loans making out is by having either, you know a certain credit score criteria. But there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions. Um, and then the other side of it would be is that the probably the best way to get a bank loan would be is that you give them some collateral, some asset that you pledge to the bank in the event that you can't pay it back. Which is why, I mean, it's difficult to get a home loan, but it's not in some areas. And the reason why it wouldn't be is that if you're in an area where housing prices are always rising, right, then you could easily use the house as the collateral um, and banks might be a bit more forgiving because they could always resell that home. Cars, it's a little bit different, right? The interest rate's a little bit higher because obviously cars depreciate much faster. And then you get to other things, right? Personal loans have no collateral behind them, so the interest rates have to be higher. Thus, credit card companies, right? The interest rates are higher because there is no collateral behind them. Um, and so we get this idea um, is that we could have some idea, some level of credit rationing. Um, and that would be where you're restricting um, the amount of credit for given interest rates. Um, and what you see is that by providing credit limits, what you do um, is that you give the borrower an incentive to repay it back, right? So that they can open up more of a credit line um, that you can borrow against. Um, the problem, right, is that also what you see is that if you're only looking at, you know, right, and we can see this in the simulation, is that if you're only using the interest rate to kind of control your loan portfolio, it's not going to do everything for you because the problem you're going to run into is that if you're a bad credit risk, um, you're not going to care what the interest rate is. You're not going to pay it back anyway. So, you know, you can run into this problem of adverse selection where, um, individuals right are only getting out the loan because they know they're not going to pay it back when the interest rate goes up higher and higher and higher your good credit risks are going to just say you know what i'm not going to borrow or i'll borrow from someone i know and the only ones now participating in the bank loans are your bad credit risks who knew they weren't going to pay it back anyway so that would be something you would need to watch for um, in your um, simulation the other thing you can kind of do to kind of control your loan portfolio is by imposing some um, covenants. And these covenants basically say that you have to achieve certain objectives or achieve certain uh, goals in order to keep um, the lending um, intact. And that if you violate that, then you have to either be monitored even more closely or you might even have to pay back all of the loan uh, right away. So, right, that could come from anything from like, you know, if let's say you had a very badly maintained house and the roof was leaking. I mean, technically speaking, a bank could come in and say, you know, we aren't comfortable with this loan we made you. You're not taking care of the property that we own along with you. You know, us as the bank, our name is on the deed. Um, you need to take care of this roof. And if you don't do it, we're going to do it and we're going to charge you for it. Um, you know, covenants aren't. You don't see them a lot, but you could imagine them being used, especially if you're if the borrowing household is really um, credit restrained. Um, a different way of doing things, which is a, it can be a little bit, um, I don't want to say unfair or inequitable, would be with what's called relationship banking. And this is what was done with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and in, in full disclosure, um, uh, I'm guilty of engaging in it. My wife is as well. Um, with relationship banking, you work closely with a bank. You move many of your assets and whatnot to that bank. And then the bank then doesn't look, it looks at your credit score, but it doesn't look at it 
totally cool so because they know you've got everything with them you've got all this business with them they know you're a good risk because they've got they know everything else about you and so they make you the loan and again this is what silicon valley bank did where ceos would you know have their own personal mortgages with the bank and you know they would the business would have all their checking accounts and savings accounts with the bank and then they could get really big lines of credit the problem right is that the relationship is being tested every day because there's nothing that really stops the depositor from moving all their stuff to someone else um, if they sense that the bank is going to fail. And that's certainly what we saw um, with Silicon Valley Bank. And so this is kind of what we see here as well, then, is that you would manage this, um, you know, you could manage this interest rate risk by looking at how changing the interest rate is going to affect both my assets and liabilities. And what you would engage in is a kind of gap analysis where you would look at how the changes in the interest rate create um, a gap between your assets, which have a variable rate, and the market value, um, the dollar value of your variable rate liabilities. And we could look at that difference between the two. <clears throat> and what you'll see in the simulation, but what you would also see in this gap analysis is that most banks have um, uh, liabilities that have a variable rate, their deposits, whereas most of their loans are generally, like mortgages and whatnot, have a fixed rate, right? So we see usually a negative gap um, in the gap analysis between these two. And because of that negative gap, that means that banks as a business are very, very, very sensitive to interest rate changes. Again, there's your Silicon Valley Bank problem from last year, um, is that interest rates changed and they had to offer higher rates on deposits, yet the loans they made out, right, these loans and the securities, the rates were not as adjustable as, as much as the deposits, and so that created our problem. Besides the gap analysis, we would also engage in the duration analysis. And we'd look at how long of a period of time is it before interest rates can be adjusted or just some general maturity um, of the banking's products. And so what you're probably seeing in the simulation is that, again, if you have a negative um, gap, then generally what we're seeing is that you're trying to use your economy uh, PDF, your, your directions of the economy, to look at what you think is going to happen to bank profits. Are they going to increase or decrease based on your negative gap? And now for your duration gap, again, is that what's that going to cause to both my profits as well as my capital? And so then what banks find themselves doing is then trying to control um, their interest rate risk. I mean, because think about it, being a bank is a very tough business. You're making a loan or a mortgage over a 30 year time period, and somehow you have um, all these other um, interest rate products you're offering that are fixed in size, right? Where you're buying assets, treasury securities that have a fixed interest rate. And so you find then as a bank, then you say, okay, well, I need to stop offering so much so many things that have a fixed rate, I need some more products that have a floating rate, like a home equity line of credit, which adjusts with um, the markets. Or you could engage in some swaps and you could, um, you could um, change out some of these contracts and try to control for your risk um, in other ways. Okay, um, I just wanna watch my time here. Um, this isn't an economic history class, and also we're going to be talking about this in the next chapter, but um, let me just talk about this very briefly. Um, the way that the banking system exists here in the United States is that we have a dual banking system. Um, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, we have some banks that are chartered by the federal government, and we have some banks that are chartered um, by, the, by the states and some by the federal government. And um, these two systems coexist. Um, we see this, uh, again, this goes back to the Civil War. Um, the Federal Reserve as a system 
exist as our lender of last resort to make these discount loans to bank, which again, you shouldn't be borrowing money from the Federal Reserve. That means you're really in trouble. Um, before the Federal Reserve took on this role, that would be 1914, before it took on this role, which again, you're kind of dealing with in, uh, in the term paper, um, you know, banks would be subject to bank runs and bank panics, which again, would be the video that was at the beginning of this lecture. Um, such as the system that we see today, um, the only thing that's been added was during the Great Dep Depression, we added the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, which again insures everyone's deposits up to $250,000 today, um, which in essence can really stop bank runs for the most part. If we look back then again, the past 40 years, you see this increase in failures during the 2008-2009 crisis. And then the other one here that most of you are too young to have remembered, you weren't born yet, most of you, was that we had a pretty significant savings and loan crisis in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, savings and loan banks were a type of bank that made um, a lot of bad loans and those banks failed and eventually had to be taken over by the um, government. Um, really, the biggest changes to the banking system came in both the 1970s and the, and the 1990s. And that would be where basically small community banks um, were basically eliminated for the most part. Um, you used to have quite significant restrictions on banks being able to operate across um, uh, state lines. And that meant that uh, banks, because they were geographically limited, um, is a very expensive business. And what's happened since the 1970s, so over the past 40, 50 years, is that banks have become bigger and bigger because there are these economies of scale that you get by offering lots of loan products to lots of different places. The concern, though, is that today banks have become so big that they are now deemed too big to fail and that these banks can now behave in a way that is inappropriate because they know that if they really screw up that the banks will not um, be allowed to fail. Interestingly enough, fun fact, not tested in any way, is that here in Hawaii, we actually don't have any of the big banks. Um, none of these banks that are listed here in 2019, none of these banks have branches um, here in Hawaii. Um, I think Bank of America at one time for like a few years had a few, like one ATM or something like that, but none of these have branches here. But look at that. That's So this is from 2019. Your top 10 largest U.S. banks have 50% of the market share um, in terms of the deposits. Um, I always like this idea. Uh, I don't want to spend too long on it here, but uh, you used to be able to open a savings account up with the U.S. Post Office. Um, it actually increased access to families um, to be able to have access to a banking system. Um, and now, even though you know people that um, are uh, have an interest in civil rights and whatnot want to have the post office often banking account banking products again obviously the banking lobby doesn't want that so they're you know going to lobby to not have that be the case okay i'm just going to kind of make sure here i'm not this is really becoming a really long lecture here um we're going to talk about the crisis stuff later so i'm going to save that here Yeah, these last slides, I'm just in the interest of time, we're going to deal with these here in chapter 12 um, and chapter 13. So I'm just going to leave that here. Okay.